Special relativity has undoubtedly been one of the most successful theories to emerge out of recent history. Not only has the theory correctly predicted new phenomena, but also in complementing more sophisticated theories like general relativity or quantum field theory, it has helped enhance our understanding of both the very large and the very small. But despite all this, it can be an intuitively jarring theory. And Einstein himself was in fact never fully satisfied with it, writing in 1914 that the theory suffered from what he termed an undeniable fundamental defect. But what was this defect exactly? And how did he propose to overcome it? This is dialect, and today we're examining why relativity doesn't add up. Every scientific theory is predicated upon certain unprovable statements known as axioms. The axioms of classical mechanics, essentially Newton's three laws, more or less reflect intuitive beliefs about our everyday reality, i.e. that motion is related to causality, and force to motion, and action to reaction, etc. But unlike those axioms, the central axiom of special relativity that light travels at the same speed in all inertial frames, is something of a head-scratcher. It tells us that no matter what velocity observers are traveling at with respect to one another, they will all measure the same speed for any given beam of light. Unlike Newton's laws, this axiom hardly seems to follow as a consequence of any intuitive ideas. Yet by adopting it, Einstein was able to achieve quite a lot. Unite electricity and magnetism under one framework, show mass and energy were of the same form, and dispense with the need for an unobservable ether. But possibly the greatest allure this axiom held for Einstein was that it promised to overturn the absolute space and time of Newtonian physics. Einstein was an avid devotee of Ernst Mach, the philosopher who had stressed that all laws in physics ought to concern the relative motion of bodies, and not their motion as referred to some theoretical absolutist construct. Indeed, by asserting the constancy of the speed of light, Einstein felt he was achieving Mach's vision of a relative space and time. But there was one thing he knew his new theory didn't yet relativize motion. This was because it relied on an implicit definition of observers being inertial, meaning unaccelerated, in order for them to measure a constant speed of light. This quality of being unaccelerated was not relative to individual observers, but rather somehow an objective fact already agreed upon between all observers meaning it was absolute. But Einstein recognized right away that this absoluteness meant the existence of an internal tension within his theory. If motion was defined through space and time, and space and time were relative, then how could motion be anything but relative? Indeed, Einstein's immediate intuition told him this meant the theory of special relativity was incomplete. Sure, he had framed the laws of physics to be independent of any particular velocity, but this had already been a feature of Newtonian mechanics, into conformity with which special relativity merely brought the laws of electromagnetism. To Einstein, true relativity meant the relativity of all motion, not just the relativity of velocities. For that reason, in a 1914 paper entitled On the Relativity Problem, he wrote that he felt special relativity suffered from the same undeniable fundamental defect that Newtonian physics did. That is, that it relied on a notion of absolute acceleration in order to complete its formalism. So why do we care whether a formalism invokes absolute acceleration or not? Well, as Einstein pointed out in his paper, it's because absolute acceleration is undefinable. 
one would try in vain to explain what it is that one should understand by the pure and simple acceleration of a body. One would succeed only in defining the relative acceleration of bodies with respect to each other. Indeed, to make a statement about any sort of motion meaningful, be it velocity, acceleration, jerk, etc., you have to specify what you're moving relative to. For instance, if you say you're accelerating in a car, you're implying that you're accelerating relative to the ground. But if that ground were, say, actually the deck of a boat accelerating equally and oppositely over a body of water, then relative to someone on the shore, you'd actually be at rest. No physicist in their right mind would of course admit that you could have acceleration which is not relative to anything. And so formalistically speaking, the answer to this problem is to define absolute acceleration as meaning acceleration relative to an inertial frame. But of course, inertial frames are defined via an absence of acceleration. So this definition is horrifically circular. Indeed, most physicists will eschew giving that definition altogether in favor of the empirical one, wherein absolute acceleration is defined as something that can be measured with an accelerometer. Unfortunately, since any measuring instrument first has to be calibrated before it can give meaningful readings, this answer is likewise problematic. For instance, given a spring accelerometer, we'd have to make a choice of where and when to calibrate it before we could use it. And should we choose to calibrate it on a rocket ship that, unbeknownst to us, was blasting through outer space, then as soon as the rocket engines shut off, the spring would stretch, leading us to wrongly conclude that we had begun experiencing a force. Attempts to utilize a better or more sophisticated accelerometer will not bypass this calibration requirement. Meaning acceleration as measured by an accelerometer is always only acceleration relative to the frame of calibration. There is yet still one intuitive definition of absolute motion left to us, which you can find given in videos such as this Ted Ed one on the twin paradox. This is the idea that absolute acceleration i.e. non-inertial motion, can be defined as acceleration with respect to the rest of the universe. Observers. To be an inertial observer, one has to maintain a constant speed and direction relative to the rest of the universe. While on the surface this definition is highly appealing, it suffers from a crucial defect. It's non-local. That is, if acceleration is supposed to be a real effect, then the information that something is accelerating must be transmitted to that something at the moment that the acceleration occurs. But if information can only travel at the speed of light, then this information can't come from a great distance away. In other words, you can only be causally affected by things in your immediate vicinity. So the state of motion of the rest of the universe relative to you at the moment of your acceleration is both irrelevant and impossible to know. Whatever you're accelerating relative to, it must be located within your immediate vicinity. And infinitesimally so, should we take this notion of local action to its limit. This means that if we want to treat acceleration as absolutely and instantaneously real, then we are left with only two options for what you are accelerating relative to. One, an absolute space. Or two, some ether-like substance. Special relativity, of course, rejects both these possibilities, telling us that we can have neither absolutes nor ethers. But Einstein developed special relativity in 1905, before he ventured into any considerations about how acceleration played into the picture. So it's natural to see why he and others might have leapt to the conclusion that absolute space and or an ether could be dismissed altogether. 
However, by the time 1914 rolled around, Einstein had well past realized that the notion of absolute acceleration didn't mesh with his relativistic paradigm. And so to correct this undeniable fundamental defect, he concluded in his 1914 paper that the laws of physics ought to be packaged in a way so as to refer to only the motion between bodies. Indeed, in 1914, Einstein felt extremely confident that his pending theory of general relativity would achieve exactly that. This was because Einstein had begun working with tensors, a type of mathematical object which seemed to provide a way to relate the laws of physics without reference to any particular coordinate system. Eager for a way to realize Mach's program of unfettered relativism, Einstein mistakenly conflated this coordinate-free aspect of tensors with the relativity of all motion, and concluded he had finally done away with the last vestige of Newtonian absolutism. But Einstein received a serious blow in 1917, when the German physicist Erich Kretschmann pointed out to him that tensors were simply a convenient way of mathematically packaging a formalism and that pretty much any old theory could be expressed through them. Sure enough, only a few years later, the French mathematician Elie Quetton managed to reformulate classical Newtonian physics in the language of coordinate-free tensors, developing what became known as newton quetton physics. The implication of this was clear. If the absolute space, time, and motion of Newtonian physics could be expressed in the language of tensors, then the tensor formalism of general relativity indicated nothing whatsoever in regards to motion being absolute or relative. For the remainder of his life, Einstein would struggle to interpret the meaning of relativity, changing his mind frequently about its implications and completely reversing his stances on topics such as the existence of the ether or Mach's principle. But mainstream physics would ignore all this and merely retain the philosophy of relativity as Einstein had established it in 1905, before he had given full weight to the meaning of acceleration. Which means Einstein never succeeded in removing his theory's fundamental defect. And that this defect still remains with the theory today. Indeed, it's easy to see that this defect comes about because we want to treat acceleration as absolutely real, and yet at the same time persist in saying that all the components which go into making up acceleration – time, space, length, velocity – are all relative. Einstein's instinct to solve this problem by relativizing acceleration was certainly correct. But as we mentioned before, if we want all observers to agree on their states of acceleration whilst also preserving the principle of local action, this leaves only two options for what observers can be accelerating relative to – an absolute space or an ether. Since the whole point of relativity is to avoid problematical absolutes, this means we must cross the first option off our list, which leaves only the second option – the ether. And thus at once, we see why relativity is internally inconsistent. In order to handle acceleration, the formalism requires the existence of an ether. But at the same time, its philosophy, conceived only for constant velocity motion, forbids us to speak of any such ether. Of course, it's hardly a coincidence that Einstein would eventually change his mind and declare that the ether did exist. Nor is it a coincidence that it would be considerations of gravity and acceleration which would lead him to do so. Because for all the mystery surrounding what the ether may or may not be, what our current theories most strongly suggest is the idea that we detect its presence every time we accelerate. Of course, you might object that if we can have a measurable acceleration with respect to the ether, then we must also have a measurable velocity with respect to the ether. Which brings us back round to the central mystery of relativity. If the ether exists, why can't we detect our velocity with respect to it? <laughs> 
The Lorentzian answer to this question was to modify Newtonian physics with an additional axiom, stating that clocks physically slow down and rulers physically shrink when in motion with respect to the ether. This axiom in and of itself feels pretty arbitrary and jarring. But at the same time, the axiom Einstein replaced it with, that the speed of light is measurably equal in all inertial frames, hardly feels any less arbitrary or jarring. Neither are intuitive, and both leave one essentially scratching their head, going, why that? But what if we could find another axiom, a deeper, more intuitive principle, from which these two seemingly conflicting axioms would actually emerge as being one in the same thing. Indeed, some of you who have been following this channel for a while have been very patient with us, as for some time now we've been dotting our I's and crossing our T's in order to bring you an interpretation of relativity which we feel will offer a more intuitive and concrete way of understanding the theory's formalism. Our aim is to strip the theory of its mathematical abstraction and demonstrate that to every counterintuitive and bizarre phenomenon, a simple and physically meaningful picture can be coordinated. Now, of course, none of this would have been possible without the encouragement, insights, and guidance from our viewers over the years. Additionally, we want to express our gratitude for our Patreon supporters, without whose generosity this channel's continuance would also not be possible. And lastly, we want to acknowledge Henry Lindner, whose paper on the philosophical inadequacy of modern physics served as the inspiration for this video. Well, until soon, this has been Dialect. Thanks for watching.